Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our event. My name is Marlene Navel. I'm the director of the Central Asia program here at GW. It's a great pleasure for us to host Noah Tucker for this event. Noah is an associate to our Central Asia program, but he's very much known for his work as an editor for Registan, which is really one of the main websites and great source of information for what is going on in Central Asia, and especially for uh, all the work he has been doing on Uzbekistan in the last two decades. Noah has been in a very exceptional situation this last year because he has been able to work on this very kind of timely and politicized topic of the Islamic State, but he's able to kind of display his scholarly tools and knowledge of the local Central Asian languages to offer really a unique insight into uh, what is going on in the region and outside the region. Noah just released these five papers that you can find download on our website, one, of e one for each of the Central Asian states. And that's really unique first-hand information you, can, uh, you will find there. And when you will read them, you will really appreciate Noah's ability to provide a very sober uh, uh, analysis on topics that are really too often kind of hyped in the media and that are very much politicized and ideologically uh, uh, discussed both by the Central Asian state on the Russian side, also on the U.S. side. So it's very good to show that and to, to show that research and scholars can really kind of provide their own sober analysis on this kind of very timely uh, topics. It's really a unique insight that he will be able to give you not only on the Islamic State messaging, because on that topic Noah already published several papers, but today in his presentation and on the papers that have been released online, he will be mostly discussing the state's response and the public response to this messaging. So it's a very kind of fascinating analysis of all this interaction between messages and how one ideology can counter another one and how all these uh, um, met messaging, branding strategies are meeting and replying to each other. So without further ado, no, I give you the floor and thank you again for being here today. Well, um, thank you, Marlen, and thank all of you for coming. This is a much bigger crowd than I expected to get. Um, but yeah, this is ISIS, so I guess it's, <laughs> it's of interest to lots of people. Um, I also want to take a, a moment to note uh, the, the Turkmenistan paper has a co-author uh, without whom I could not have done uh, that work um, remotely. Rano Turayeva is a wonderful um, Uzbek Turkmen um, scholar uh, who lives in Germany and uh, she provided all of the Turkmen language research that went into that project. Uh, I don't know Turkmen, I can't pretend to understand Turkmen aside from what I can pick up uh, from Uzbek. So I, I could not have done that without her and I was uh, I was privileged and pleased to get to work with her on that. Um, so in the presentation today, it's going to mirror a little bit the structure of each of the reports, uh, which you can view on, on the CAP website and download. Um, it's a lot of material. It's about 50 pages or so when you put all of it together. So it's, it's quite a bit to look at, and it's way too much to talk to you <laughs> about all of today. So. Uh, in what I do today, I'm going to try to um, do something that I haven't done with the reports yet, and sort of synthesize all of them, and look at the way, look at the trends, pull out the trends that we see for the region, and talk about them together, and the contrasts um, that we see uh, within the region. And then, of course, I'll also summarize some of the information that's in each of them. So the presentation that I'm going to do today will mirror the sections of the reports. So first, I'm going to talk about the ISIS messaging and their strategies itself. Um, and and it's one of the really interesting things about this in Central Asia is that the ISIS messaging differs. Their strategy and their substance differs radically between countries and the audiences. And so we'll address that briefly. Then we'll talk about state responses, the public responses, um, sort of divided into both conspiracy and counter messaging. And then we'll have some policy takeaways. And then hopefully um, I'll make sure to leave ample time for discussion uh, because I would really like to hear from you, and, and there are many people in the room who have much more to contribute than I do, uh, even in this. I just wrote a bunch of papers. <laughs> um, so I want to also say at the beginning uh, that in each of these papers and in some of my remarks today, I'm going to have something 
critical to say about each of the five countries and their responses. At some point, I think there will be some, some surprising um, positive strategies that are identified. Uh, for example, most of the positive strategies that we're going to talk about are from Uzbekistan. And that is not something that I would have expected, <laughs> given my experience and other things that I've talked about before, and probably not something that people would expect to hear from me. But um, I want to do, I want to ensure that we have a clear headed look at the strategies that either work or don't work. Um, because we all agree that recruiting from Central Asia is a problem, and we agree that we need to cooperate um, in order to solve this problem. So the critical remarks that I talk about today are going to be about strategies, um, and, and to an end, not of advancing some sort of particular ideology or advancing even a democratization agenda, in spite of the fact that I believe in those things. And at the end, in the policy takeaways, I'm going to talk a lot about religious freedom and why I think that religious freedom is a solid policy strategy in this case. Um, but we're not talking about ideological pressure. We're talking about finding common goals and policies that actually work. And we need to keep in mind, too, that the United States and Europe both face these problems in the same way. In fact, you know, jihadist recruiting into ISIS in particular out of Europe is much higher and more frequent than it is in Central Asia. Um, I get asked, you know, sometimes uh, to, to talk about well, what is this about Central Asians that causes them to be recruited into the Syrian <laughs> conflict? Well, I don't know. There are more, the per capita rate of Belgians and French who are recruited into ISIS is 10 times higher than it is for Central Asia. So there is not something particular about Central Asians that causes them to be recruited, even about the, about the background in the region. But this is a problem that we face in common, and, and it's these strategies are ones that we get wrong and we get right inside the United States and our own efforts to deal with terrorist recruiting and domestic terrorism and in Europe as well. So while I make some critical comments, we're looking for finding solid policy. So, uh oh, frozen. Okay, so in section one, we're going to talk about the tactics, resources, and strategies for recruiting in each country. And they are, as I mentioned before, surprisingly different um, in all five. We have two groups, though, basically, that they fall into. Uh, the first group is Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Kyrgyzstan. The messaging from ISIS members in Uzbekistan is something that I've written about um, separately, and I've given talks here a couple of times about this, so I'm not going to dwell on this very long. If you're interested in this, there's already material um, that you can look at. But just to say, basically, um, the Uzbek ISIS messaging was very different um, from, uh, from messaging from, from other ethnic groups in Central Asia for several years because they were the only ones and are the only ones who have ever developed organized media outreach, um, organized recruiting efforts. They had and were, were preparing to create an official wing actually of Al Hayat in the Uzbek language. There's going to be an Al Hayat Uzbek channel. Um, they had a website, they had video channels, they had a spokesman. Um, they had a really highly sophisticated and coherently messaged media outreach until the fall of 2014 and then it disappeared. Um, and so that part has been gone. But um, one of the things that we can say about the strategy and that continues to be consistent is that Uzbek messaging, Uzbek language messaging focuses on anyone who can understand the language. They're not directed specifically at Uzbekistan, specifically at Kyrgyzstan, specifically at Uzbeks living in Russia, wherever else. It's focused on an ethno-linguistic community. And this is true of the other countries as well. So they don't talk a whole lot about Uzbekistani politics. They don't respond in the way that the IMU does, for example, often to recent developments inside the country. They focus on, you know, sort of big, big picture ideology uh, for ISIS. Like this bottom one is a screenshot uh, from, um, from a, a video where they just gather together Uzbeks from all the different Central Asian countries and they throw their passports on a bonfire and burn them, rejecting their civic citizenship and you know, doing this symbolic act of joining the caliphate and you know, rejecting the Westphalian state model and all of this stuff. So this is, what, this is the way that Uzbeks have targeted and they target anyone else who speaks the Uzbek language. It's not, not specific responses to politics. 
And they also have, they had particular spokesmen and this sort of thing who were sort of professional media outreach. Uh, in Tajikistan, where we actually have, uh, at least according to most of the numbers that we can sort of agree on, the contingent of Tajiks inside ISIS is probably the largest um, from Central Asia. Uh, the Tajik government just this week released numbers up to 1,500 at this point. I'm, I'm skeptical about that, but these are the numbers that they're, that they're tossing around. Um, Tajik messaging is completely different. Uh, it's never been organized. They release their videos. Um, the, the, the Tajiks don't have their own, their own independent commands. They work within, um, they, they serve under Umar Shashani's brigade for the most part. And so they work, um, they work underneath mostly fighters from the Caucasus who are who are looking at Russian language messaging, the Tajik language messaging that's produced, have generally been focused on um, these celebrity commanders. Abu Kulobi was the first one, and he had, a, he had a very interesting career where he made a lot of really wild, provocative statements. He got phone numbers of newspaper editors in Tajikistan. He would call them and threaten them you know, at home when they published negative things about ISIS. He had a very interesting, colorful career until he was blown up uh, and died, and no one ever heard from him again. And then uh, Special Forces Colonel Gumaran Halima, most of you are probably familiar with that case, another who just ignited all of the Tajik media sphere, was everything anyone was talking about for a month until he was blown up. <laughs> and then we got a picture of him with his, in like a full body cast, looking happy and smiling with the put the finger up and then we've never really heard from him again. Uh, so these are sort of short-lived. It's not a very consistent messaging, it's not really focused on ideology. Um, it has been angry and responding to things that happen specifically in Tajikistan and Tajikistani domestic politics, um, but it focuses on these kind of hero commanders who have a fairly short lifespan um, most of the time. Average lifespan, of, there are some of the other groups, the groups from Russia and the Caucasus, who also use this same sort of technique for their messaging. And one of the problems with it is the average lifespan for one of these celebrity commanders is about six months. Um, and so it's difficult for them to have sort of consistent attention and consistent messaging. Uh, Kyrgyzstan is short because there has only ever been one <laughs> message produced by Maybe the one Kyrgyz guy who's in ISIS. We don't really know. We assume there are probably others. Um, the Kyrgyzstani citizens who have joined ISIS, the evidence that we've seen, at least available from public sources, show that most of the Kyrgyzstani citizens involved are Uzbeks from southern Kyrgyzstan, um, rather than ethnic Kyrgyz from other places. Uh, in June of last year, July of last year, I'm sorry, um, this video appeared in which a, a guy uh, who didn't identify himself uh, told everyone that they were living in uh, they were living in sin in Kyrgyzstan and they needed to move to the caliphate in order to prevent themselves from going to hell. And it lasted about ten minutes. He's just sort of sitting in this nice peaceful wooded background. It's nothing like the other ISIS videos. And then it was over, and we've never heard from them again. So this is a very, very different than um, in the other states. But the state response in Kyrgyzstan is interesting. We'll talk about that next. Um, in Kazakhstan, it, it, uh, there's, the second group is Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan. So they really have nothing in common um, with with the other three, uh, partly because the there are not so many ethnic Kazakhs within ISIS who message toward Kazakhstan, attempting to recruit other Kazakhs. What we see instead is that, um, for whatever reason, the ethnic Kazakhs who are members of ISIS have been chosen by ISIS media wing Al-Hayat as these poster children for a multi-ethnic caliphate. Uh, and literally children, poster children for the most part. Most of the Kazakh videos have featured children um, learning to use guns, uh, supposedly executing spies and this sort of thing and they're often they're not done in Kazakh language they're not even always done in Russian language they come with English subtitles and Arabic subtitles they're released by Al Hayat Central and get more attention in sort of the global media uh, than they do inside Kazakhstan they're really not aimed at recruiting other Kazakhs they they're used by 
um, by Al Hayat, by ISIS media wing, in order to in order to prove a, a particular point, um, which does not resonate well with people inside Kazakhstan, who can see right away, you know, this is being we're being used, and, and some of our citizens are being duped. So it. It's been, it's generated a tremendous amount of global response, but had very little resonance or even always an awful lot of response inside Kazakhstan. Turkmenistan is a particular case. Um, Turkmenistan is very interesting. We'll talk about it a little bit more later. In this section, all that we can actually say about Turkmenistan and ISIS is that there are no Turkmenistani ISIS videos. <laughs> And there is no evidence um, available in public that there are any Turkmenistanis fighting in ISIS. Um, international organizations and a number of Russian think tanks have claimed that there are 300 to 500 Turkmenistanis fighting in ISIS. Um, but it's highly probable that a lot of the people um, in Turkmen social media who talk about this uh, are of this opinion that what's happened is international organizations and observers don't understand the difference between ethnic Turkmen who are native to Syria, Turkey, and Iraq, and people from Turkmenistan. So they hear Turkmen, they look on the map and see, oh, there's a country called Turkmenistan, this must be where these people are from. Um, but in reality, there are, um, we know that there are ethnic Turkmen brigades who fight um, allied on different sides of the conflict in, I think, both Syria and Iraq. They have nothing to do with Turkmenistan, the country. Um, these people are indigenous to the region. Uh, so what Turkmenistan becomes actually is a really interesting example of how you can create a large um, sort of noise, a big noise and big sort of fury about this idea that Turkmenistanis are fighting in ISIS artificially without any evidence that it's actually happening, with no response to Turkmenistan-focused messaging. There's never been an ISIS video aimed at recruiting people from Turkmenistan. Um, the one case that we had that set all of it off, um, that we'll talk about a little bit more later, was a, a guy named Kazakov who was arrested in 2013 by Turkish authorities. And he was part of, uh, he was part of Jamwa under uh, Omar Shishani, but before Omar Shishani joined ISIS. So actually, even in this case, we found one militant who supposedly had a Turkmenistani passport, but even he was not actually a member of ISIS. Okay, so moving on to state responses. Now that we've got a basis for, for talking about what the state is responding to, um, one of the things that we find here is that, again, they fall basically into two groups. And these two groups, again, are Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, and then Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan separately. In the first group, Uzbekistan, um, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan, discussion of ISIS and state policies related to ISIS um, pretty clearly correspond to election <coughs> cycles over the past year. Um, this is not to say that it's completely instrumentalized or that they're not responding to a genuine threat, but um, there's a very clear pattern <laughs> that these state responses are tied directly to election cycles. Uh, in Uzbekistan, the real noise about ISIS um, began in the run-up to the presidential election in February and March of last year. Um, most of the Tajikistani discussion um, in official media and state responses and state policy corresponded to the parliamentary elections that the IRPT was frozen out of. Um, and in Kyrgyzstan, we have all of a sudden we're discovering ISIS everywhere in Kyrgyzstan just before the parliamentary elections in which the president's party was confirmed the largest majority. So we can't be entirely cynical and say that this problem isn't real, but on the other hand, you can't see a pattern that's obvious and not talk about it. Um, the primary response in these three countries to the problem of ISIS recruiting has been the same response that they've had to any type of Islamist extremism for the past 10 and 15 years. Um, they view this as an ideological contest of some kind between um, national values and foreign values. And so ISIS is a sign of the danger of allowing quote-unquote, our Muslims to become more like foreign Muslims. 
And so the way that they choose to combat the threat, looking at it this way, or defining it in this way, is to, for the most part, crack down on what they call foreign Islam or foreign Islamic customs. Uh, so in Tajikistan, for example, the first response is to cut off everyone's beards. Um, <clears throat> I still have not seen a well-articulated argument for how not having a beard will prevent you from being recruited by ISIS, but this is all jokes aside, the primary response by Tajikistani authorities. Uh, at first, uh, in, in the first part of the year in 2014, it looked like this might be sort of isolated incidents, uh, but then you've probably seen a number of articles came out at the beginning of this year that say um, we've seen up to like 13,000 cases of this. It's become widespread countrywide. Men with beards are being pulled aside on the street by police and forced to come into a barber shop or forced to come to the police station, sometimes beaten, sometimes not. You know, uh, this, sort of, this, is the, this is the primary response. So this only makes sense, again, if we understand that the state is viewing this as a problem of foreign or imported customs of some kind. This is Tajik tradition versus uh, Islamic tradition or foreign Islamic tradition of some kind. And if we can just prevent people from becoming foreign Muslims, then we can, we can counteract ISIS propaganda. Um, the second response inside Tajikistan um, and lots of other people have written on this in the last year, and many of you who study Central Asia will be familiar with this. We won't spend a lot of time with it, although it's very important. Um, the second response has been to crack down on any Islamically related political activity, which means first banning, uh, first cutting the IRPT out of parliament in violation of the 1997 peace accord that ended the Tajik civil war, then uh, taking away the IRPT's legal status, and then eventually in September of last year, um, declaring the IRPT, which is the Islamic Renaissance Party of Tajikistan, an extremist and terrorist organization, which makes membership and past membership illegal and subjects uh, tens of thousands of people um, to potential arrests for having been members of the IRPT at any point in their lives. Um, this is again justified by saying that Tajik national politics are led by Tajik national political leaders like Imam, Imam Ali Rahman. And if you're trying to articulate a, an Islamic politics, then that is foreign. This is, they repeatedly tie IRPT um, to ISIS, to Iran, to the Muslim Brotherhood, to any sort of scary sounding Islamic organization in another part of the world. Um, and ISIS is among those. So this is state response in Tajikistan. In Kyrgyzstan, um, we have response on a couple of different levels. On the, at the national level, uh, you have responses like the one I mentioned earlier. Um, or Sorry, I didn't get to that yet. <laughs> um, at the national level, uh, uh, what I was mentioning earlier is, is trying to identify um, ISIS flags and supposed members of ISIS inside the country just in the months before the parliamentary election. Um, this is often done in, in a sort of ham-handed way. In July, in particular, special forces got into a firefight with some identified criminals in central Bishkek. A um, number of people's homes were burned down. Um, a lot of people were nearly injured. All the criminal, all the criminals who were shooting back at the police were killed, uh, and then the police discovered an ISIS flag in the house and began, the special services began to make this argument that these folks had not been ordinary criminals, they had long criminal records and, and membership and demonstrated organized crime or identified organized crime organizations, um, but these guys were mafia people who had signed some sort of agreement with ISIS and who just happened to have also been aligned with the political opposition former President Bakiyev. Uh, but they're also ISIS. And that's about the strength of the argument. There's never any, there's never any, uh, there's never any evidence articulated for it other than this flag that they allegedly found in the house. 
Um, then, within a couple of days, the security services announced that there had been a massive terror plot that these people had been planning um, that they had now successfully prevented, and an attack on the Russian Air Force Base at Khan. Um, so it's a very convenient story that doesn't have an awful lot of evidence behind it. On the local level, though, and this is one of the things that I want to especially emphasize, um, we see things happening at the national level in these responses, but just like uh, as people like Sheila Fitzpatrick and other Russian historians a few years ago began to unpack the Stalin era and the Nep era in Russian history, one of the things that we find is that once you identify an enemy, there's a great deal of local level improvisation um, that follows, and that these sorts of repressions of the identified enemy are not always particularly well driven or organized from the top. Uh, so in the Soviet era, for example, um, the, the enemy in, in NAP and during collectivization was the kulaks. So if you wanted your neighbor's cows, or if your neighbor had more cows than you did, or a larger farm than you did, you could go and report him to your local community and say he's a kulak, and he'd be arrested and, and sent off to the kulak. We see a sort of, but, but that does not necessarily mean that this was well organized or directed from the very top or somehow controlled by Stalin himself. The state sets up the atmosphere in which these things can happen, and then uh, that creates a lot of leeway for local level officials to act out petty grievances and um, it creates a lot of incentives for them to identify these people of the, the enemy of the day and create arrest lists and things like that. Uh, so that's another one of the things that we see happening in southern Kyrgyzstan. Uh, in southern Kyrgyzstan in particular, focus on ethnic Uzbeks who were previously accused of criminal activity or causing riots during the 2010 ethnic violence um, are now accused of being members of ISIS uh, directly. And we have one case in particular from February of last year, uh, Dilmarat Haidarov, who was falsely imprisoned for three years on charges of inciting ethnic hatred and murder, I think, during the 2010 ethnic riots. His lawyers were able to prove that he was innocent. He won his appeal, which very rarely happens. Uh, he was released from prison after serving three years. And within a month or so of his release from prison, he's accused of joining ISIS. And thankfully for him, at that point, he had already left the country. Um, but again, there's little evidence presented. Uh, it's a very convenient story. On a more serious note, um, Roshod Kamalov, who's the very last of the influential Uzbek imams in the South who were not removed after, um, after the 2010 ethnic violence, was accused last year of first recruiting for ISIS and then simply inciting interreligious hatred um, and jailed for now 10 years uh, on extremely dubious charges. But this is the same example where you have someone that local level authorities wanted to target and if they weren't able to do it on one set of charges before, now they can accuse them of supporting ISIS. Um, and we'll, we'll come back to him several times in the presentation. Uh, another great example of this, one of my favorite examples inside Uzbekistan, not favorite in the sense that this is good, um, but it's just so, uh, it's so ridiculous. Uh, this is Arama Sabakian, and in October or November of this year, he was arrested and on charges of supporting uh, ISIS and, and planning to move to Syria and join them. The problem with this story is that Aramis Avakian is an Armenian Orthodox Christian who had grown a beard as part of a mourning ritual for his younger brother's death. And as it turns out, when you look into the story a little bit more closely, you find that he owned a successful fish farm um, it's, it's just it's so bizarre. He owned a fish farm uh, in the middle of the desert in Uzbekistan, and a local Hakim was trying to pressure him to sell his fish farm. When he refused to sell his fish farm, he was accused of being an ISIS member. And a confession was extracted under torture that he later retracted. Uh, citing torture, but he's on trial now as we speak. Um, but he and uh, four of the men who work for him 
are all on trial for being ISIS members with no other evidence uh, other than that he happened to have a beard at the time that he was arrested. Uh, in Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan, in the second group, we see a very different approach um, to state responses. Kazakhstan's response um, has been to focus on the way that, uh, that the Kazakh citizens who join ISIS have been manipulated and tricked and are being taken advantage of, which is, is very accurate, I think. Uh, another one of the important contrasts between Kazakhstan and the other countries is that in order to justify all of this pressure against domestic opposition or, or local, level, um, local level enemies of local officials, these, the three countries in the first group have talked all the time about how there is an imminent territorial threat that ISIS is about to invade at any moment. Um, this is based on all sorts of different stories and it changes every couple of months um, in, in the run-up to the Uzbek presidential elections in February and March of last year. There were all these stories going around with very specific numbers of ISIS members who had supposedly gathered on the border of Turkmenistan and were planning to use Turkmenistan as a corridor to invade and conquer Tashkent, which is, according to these stories, their main goal in Central Asia. Um, Kazakhstan has nothing to do with that. Um, really interestingly, Kazakhstan, several um, people related to the Kazakh government or, or in positions of influence have said very clearly that they do not believe that ISIS is a territorial threat to the security of Kazakhstan. So it's a very different approach. And they view it generally as a problem of policing. Um, and, and this is, I think, a, a fairly rational approach. Another thing Kazakhstan has done is to use this as an opportunity to emphasize the way that, um, that Kazakhstan is facing the same sort of threat as Europe and the United States and um, to, to really emphasize the way that they participate in international organizations. Um, Astana hosted the first, um, well, first in the region, regional countering violent extremism conference uh, last year um, in, at the end of June, early July. Um, and so they've, they've been very quick show leadership and membership in a global effort. Um, and we, we're skipping Turkmenistan because Turkmenistan's response is there are no Turkmenistan. There are no Turkmenistan citizens in Syria and there are none in ISIS. We'll talk about that again later. Um, so the public responses are divided uh, sort of into two not even even groups. Um, the, vast majority of public responses, I'm sort of sad to say, fall into the realm of conspiracy theory. And this is fueled by, uh, by access and connections both to Middle Eastern media, but very importantly, connections to Russian media and material produced by Russian state-owned media agencies and known or suspected Russian information operations. Um, <coughs> So this is a typical example of the kind of thing that this this come this pull from a Facebook group. It's a mixed Kazakh language, Russian language group that's called the anti-extremism group, Kazakhstan anti-extremism or anti-extremism in Kazakhstan. Um, and this graphic is pulled directly from a state-owned Russian media company. It comes from Regnum, and it's very difficult to tell whether the people who interact with media objects like this know that it came from Russian media or, or are aware of this. The, the Russian media penetration is so strong, in, especially on Kazakh social media, that it's really hard to disaggregate anything else um, from it. Uh, the other thing that gives Russian media operations and, uh, a, um, a leg up in Kazakhstan is that the majority of Kazakh internet content takes place in Russian and actually the majority of Kazakhstan registered websites are based in, uh, are hosted on servers inside Russia. Uh, so Russia has a great deal of influence over what goes on in Kazakhstan, but in the rest of the region as well. Um, some of it comes, some of the misinformation comes from the Middle East, some of it comes from Russia, but all of it agrees for the most part um, that ISIS is actually a puppet of the United States. This is probably the single most common response 
in discussion about ISIS. ISIS is not really a Muslim group. ISIS is a front for the CIA. Um, people will often cite historical precedent by claiming that Al-Qaeda was created by the CIA in the 1980s. Um, this is sort of, this is one of these facts that's difficult to, one of these facts, quote unquote, that's very difficult to get around in the Central Asian media environment. Um, this, most people believe this. And so when someone else says, yo, ISIS is just another case of a group founded by the United States, um, it's very easy for many people to go along with that because it resonates with how they understand history. Um, there are lots of uh, sort of Middle East-based conspiracy theories too. One of the most common ones is that uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi is actually a former Mossad agent and is controlled by Israel. I mean, this is, we laugh, but many of the people in the Central Asian media environment believe this. These different versions of this have been over everywhere. And then the other one is that John McCain meets with Baghdadi and gives directions. Many of these, a lot of times, these two myths are put together into one. He's a Mossad agent controlled by John McCain, this kind of thing. And these, the pictures of McCain with someone who's identified as Baghdadi, there's dozens of different examples of this that come from all over the place. It's not isolated to Middle Eastern environment either. Actually, you can find this on Alex Jones' info wars in the United States. So within right-wing circles inside the United States, this is also a very popular conspiracy theory. And it appears to be documented by US sites that way as well. Um, here's another example of it. This is him in his Mossad days, allegedly. So obviously, if you just take a slightly longer beard on that guy, yeah. you'll get Baghdadi. <laughs> so there are all of these people who bear some sort of passing resemblance to Baghdadi if he had a shorter beard or if he had no beard, who have been identified. In, in, and this is sort of funny, but I mean, I'm not, <coughs> I'm not exaggerating when I say this is the majority of discourse in response to ISIS um, within the Central Asian environment. The other thing that we see is lots of stuff that comes directly from Russia. Um, this is an example of another one of the common myths that in the Edward Snowden leaks, it says that the United States founded and trained ISIS in collaboration with Mossad. I can't count the number of times that I've seen this. This next series of slides that I'm going to give you actually um, come from just one group that I believe is probably a Russia-funded information operation that's it's called itself an anti-Salafi group. It's mostly in Tajik, based in Tajikistan. The next 10 slides or so that I'm going to show you are just the stuff that I pulled off of there all in a row. Um, it, it's like the last 10 posts that have been in this group. And they really well exemplify some of the most common myths that are spread. So Edward Snowden, Edward Snowden's NSA leaks confirm that the United States founded both Al-Qaeda and ISIS. Um, this is an Israeli general who was taken prisoner in Iraq, admitted that there's a close cooperation between Israel and ISIS. This is from, again, a Russian information operation. Uh, uh, ISIS radio station is located on US air base. Um, this is USA National Gulf Army. That's an identified Russian information operation. Um, and this is just Photoshop fun, all the Western world leaders giving buckets of money to Al Baghdadi. Um, and then here's another one. This, this works in so many different ways. So you, this is another, this is, these are very common from Russian information operations. So you have ISIS on one side and you have America on the other side. And so America is actually trying to force gay marriage and ISIS on you at the same time. So America is the source of both Islamic radicalism and radical liberalism, both of which are an affront to Central Asian societies, and you're being attacked from both ends, but the source is the United States. And this colors and characterizes an awful lot of the discussion. Um, this is a great example of, uh, of a kind of conspiracy that just floats around in the air and then becomes applied to something specific. This photo is a funny, um, it's, it's, I think it's a sort of witty Tajik pun on the name of uh, Colonel Gomeran Halimov, 
says the colonel immoral traitor, and these are the Muslims of Syria, and of course Uncle Sam and Israel are controlling him as a puppet and murdering the Muslims of Syria. You'll see that this is a, his, Umrah and Halima's face has been photoshopped into this and the text has been added, but if you do a Google search for this image, this same image with different faces photoshopped onto the puppet have been used in dozens of different places to talk about a U.S.-Israel conspiracy for this or that. <laughs> sometimes it's ISIS, sometimes it's another group, sometimes it's about Palestine, sometimes it's about Libya, sometimes it's about Egypt. This photo is sort of a meta-conspiracy meme that's been used in so many different places. So sometimes it's directed and sometimes it's just floating out there in the air. The conspiracies are also used by um, used by recruiters for, uh, for the extremist groups themselves. So this is an example of a conspiracy theory that says all the American or Western leaders are cooperating together to, um, to get Muslims to accept democracy and forsake Sharia and forsake, forsake the caliphate. Um, and they're all laughing at them because they've tricked them into accepting democracy and rejecting their faith and rejecting the prophet. And uh, the, the sign that Obama is holding says, now they worship us instead of the prophet. Um, or now they give their, the, not worship the prophet, but, uh, but, but uh, venerate. Uh, so these conspiracy theories work on both sides and the, the groups that are recruiting take advantage of this. Okay, so the second group of public responses uh, are responses to the states themselves and their new policies and responses to the group. And this group, I think, are, are the, they're the minority, but they're the ones that I find most interesting. These are Muslims themselves um, who are responding and saying both to their states and to ISIS that your understanding of our religion is wrong and this is not what we represent. Um, so this was um, um, after... Um, after Prime Minister Suryev in the fall or late summer or fall of last year made some comments immediately after all the talk about ISIS in the country that the first thing that they have to go after in order to solve the problem of potential ISIS recruiting is women wearing hijab. If we take hijab off of all the women, this will prevent them from being recruited into ISIS. And there are a number of that, that drew a lot of public anger. Um, this was one of the memes that um, I pulled this from, I think, a, a, uh, a women's forum, a, a Muslim women's forum, and these women are pointing out that you're saying that covering your head is some sort of foreign intervention or foreign fashion, but look at how our ancestors dressed. Um, this is another one, a direct response to Surya. This is Prime Minister Surya being controlled and manipulated. Um, this was from the Hizbut Tahrir forum. Uh, in Tajikistan, there's been lots of response uh, to the forced beard shaving. Um, one of the first, the first sort of big public reaction to it came when the authorities in Hujan made the mistake of forcibly shaving the beard of one of the country's most popular bloggers, Rustam Gulov, and this then exploded into public attention. Um, and they've done some pretty interesting things in this. These are, um, this is a fake that was created by opponents uh, of the, these are, we think probably was created by opponents of these new beard and hijab rules. There was a, this floated around for a while to see that the government was going to begin issuing permits that you would have to get in order to have a beard or have hijab and this would have to be certified. And there's tremendous public anger in response to this, a great deal of popular backlash. And no one ever claimed responsibility for doing it, but it appears that um, sort of activists who didn't want to see this happen sent this out as really sort of a satire, a very clever satire, to create public backlash against it. Um, on a much more serious note, uh, a 23-year-old Vedat resident named Umar Babajanov in September was beaten to death by police officers, um, allegedly, according to social media sources, for having his beard. And this created just a firestorm of anger, again, on social media. And actually, for a short while, um, General Nazarzada's rebellion was claimed by a number of social media users to have been a direct response to this young man being beaten to death by police in his home district. 
didn't turn out to be true, and it didn't keep legs for very long, but there was a, there was a short time when there are a lot of Tajik social media users who were cheering on General Nazarzadeh in his rebellion against the government because they believed he was standing up for one of his residents and his right to faith. Um, the discourse also works both ways. It's not just Muslims, um, Muslim users trying to defend their rights to religious freedom. We also have, particularly in Kyrgyzstan, um, a lot of the media and, and a number of social media users have gotten really attached to this idea uh, that's floated around, we see it here in meme form, that there are more mosques than schools inside Kyrgyzstan. And this, is, this has been addressed by the government, this has been discussed in op-eds and major newspapers, and this is one of these things that uh, a lot of people are citing as um, this alarming sign of Islamization and foreign Islam growing in Kyrgyzstan. But then we have other responses to this um, from devout Muslims who, you know, you have these babies drinking beer on one side and then a young woman being dressed in hijab to go to school by her mother and it says, what are you teaching your child? Um, so this is implying that having more mosques than schools is not necessarily a problem. It might be a positive thing. And then um, we have users who just reject the government's claims that ISIS is some sort of imminent threat or is really an issue that they should have to be worried about inside their country without any reference to religion. Um, this is an Uzbek cartoon from a new publication called El Tuz that does a lot of satirical cartoons. And the fall of the year, there was this rumor that there had been an ISIS flag planted on the top of the parliament building in downtown Tashkent. And this was pretty quickly dismissed, and um, this cartoon mocks the rumor. Uh, the guy on the left says, hey brother, did you hear that this flag was put up? And um, the one on the right says, oh, that's not an ISIS flag, that's our flag. It just turned black from all the pollution. <laughs> <laughs> so on a, more, <clears throat> on a more serious note, the users who respond directly to ISIS and cooperate um, to reject it have also organized some really interesting social media counter messages. Um, and these are things, they're not organized by a state, they're not organized by an organization, these are just people um, having these discussions. In many cases, um, uh, from the versions that I'm gonna give, um, observant Muslims who are rejecting ISIS claims that they represent some sort of true Islam. I've talked about this in a couple of presentations before and I've written about it in other places, so I won't go over it a lot, but one of the most, uh, one of the best examples of this that I've seen is when uh, the Jordanian pilot was executed last year in the spring um, by fire. This created a huge backlash um, in Uzbek language social media, particularly inside Uzbekistan, because it resonated with many of them who had watched videos five years ago of their ethnic Uzbek compatriots in southern Kyrgyzstan being burned to death um, by mobs. Uh, and at the time, they had talked about all of the different places in the Hadith where it says that you are not allowed to kill anything by fire, not even animals or insects. And so this resonated very strongly for Uzbeks in 2010, who said, how is it possible that these, that are the Kyrgyz who claim to also be Muslims are burning us to death when fire is a punishment reserved only for Allah. So the fire of hell is, is the right of, of God, and no man can take that into his own hands. And so when ISIS did this, there were lots of Uzbeks um, who recognized this parallel and said immediately, this is not Sharia, you cannot do this. This is not allowed, this is forbidden, so how can they claim to be true Muslims and be doing things that are in direct contradiction to the way that we know and understand Islamic law. Um, other groups, even organized Islamist groups like Hizb al-Tahrir, for example, have also banded together to reject, um, reject the, the claims of authority of a caliphate in Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, and even their claim to be able to use the banner of the Prophet as their flag. Um, so this is a this is um, this is a graphic that was used by a number of his Bata career users for a couple of months last year. They replaced it as their profile ID on Facebook and other networks. 
and uh, to, to reject the ISIS use of the flag of the Prophet. They said, we reject colonialist flags, but we also reject your ability to use this flag because it belongs to all Muslims, not just to you. Um, another really interesting source of, uh, of very theologically articulate opposition to ISIS are Uzbek Salafis. Um, there's a lot of talk about Salafist groups in Uzbekistan or Uzbekistani Salafis. Very rarely do you find the actual ones, but there are groups of them um, based in the Middle East, mostly in Saudi Arabia, and this is sort of their primary forum. And they've done uh, a lot of work introducing this argument that's had a lot of resonance in the Middle East, um, that ISIS are not real Muslims. ISIS, they connect them to uh, the Harajite heresy in Islam. And this is something that is, it doesn't have a ton of resonance inside Central Asia because most Central Asians don't know who the Harajites were. It's in Uzbek, it's Habarichlar. And uh, Russians talk about them as um, Harajiti. Uh, but um, on the Salafi forums where people are really steeped in this sort of history and, um, and theology, this has an awful lot of resonance and carries traction. Um, and then another great example of uh, the day in July of 2014, uh, within days of the time in July of 2014 that Abu Bakr declared the caliphate, um, Rashid Kamalaf in southern Kyrgyzstan preached a sermon in his mosque that rejected those claims and very soundly um, laid out these theological and historical principles for why Abu Bakr could not claim to be the leader of all Muslims. Ironically, it was videotape of exactly that sermon that the Kyrgyzstani prosecutors used to say that he was inciting religious hatred. It's very, it's very difficult to see how they got to that, but that was what they did. Um, so we'll talk finally about some policy takeaways in this, what works and what doesn't. Um, so this is a good example from Uzbekistan. In the spring of last year, um, the Uzbekistani Mufti had put together this pamphlet uh, that was meant to be flashy and accessible to all Muslims and was going to lay out these arguments for why um, why ISIS was illegitimate and why Uzbeks shouldn't join. They tried their best to give it legs and publicity. They had conferences. They partnered up with one of the more com one of the most popular uh, pop culture sites in Uzbekistan and for Uzbeks everywhere actually sayo.com and tried to organize the release of the pamphlet, and it just really got no traction. Uh, it didn't get a lot of public attention. So they did something, this is Sayot, they did something very interesting and really unprecedented in the recent history of Uzbekistan. Um, one of the most popular and sort of authoritative Muslim figures in, in this generation uh, has been in prison for the last five years on pretty dubious terrorism charges. And they released him and made him the new spokesman for the Mufti's anti-ISIS campaign. And within two weeks of his release, um, he released a new poem um, called the ISIS Fitna. And his poem then was, was produced by Sayod. Again, they're, they're, they're working together with a pop culture site. The poem is voiced over some of the pictures from the pamphlet. And this pamphlet that went absolutely nowhere before, once it was combined with um, the poem from a tremendously popular um, pop culture figure, exploded in popularity. And they went from getting a couple of hundred views to tens and tens of thousands. Uh, so this was actually an extremely successful uh, an extremely successful counter-messaging effort. So the first takeaway in this is that religious freedom allowing people basic freedom, like not being in jail <laughs> in order to produce things like this, is one of the key conditions for any sort of broad, grassroots, anti-extremist pushback. Um, state messages have just not resonated, um, but these and the job is too big. There's just so much out there, and there's so many conspiracy theories out there. The states cannot do this by themselves. They need a broad public-based effort. And in order to do that, in order to challenge ISIS on its claims of Islamic legitimacy, they need Muslims to do this, um, because they just don't have the authority to do it themselves. And you're not going to have Muslims who can counter it unless they have freedom. 
Um, some positive examples um, from inside Uzbekistan actually are um, the Islam Uz network that I've talked about before, but also a relatively new site um, called Kadriat Uz that's totally independent really of the Mufti and um, run by some brilliant young Uzbeks that addresses things that young Uzbek Muslims are truly interested in. And um, this effort and some others are based at the large and growing Minor Mosque in Tashkent. And they have a lot of public resonance and, and genuine popularity. Um, but the counter to this is that indiscriminate religious persecution and social injustice are key vulnerabilities exploited by extremist recruiting. So this picture is interesting. This is pulled from an exchange on Facebook between an Uzbek living inside Uzbekistan and an IMU recruiter. And the IMU recruiter is saying, you have no religious freedom in Uzbekistan, so you have to perform hijrah, you have to come here and live in Afghanistan and Pakistan so that you can be a true Muslim. And um, this guy who went to Ugos Minor in Tashkent posted this picture from his mosque and showed a parking lot full of people and said, how can you tell me that we don't have any religious freedom in Uzbekistan when we have all of these Muslims who are able to come and meet together? So many times in the past, though, once a mosque begins to become popular and has, is headed by a charismatic imam, that imam has generally been arrested and put away. This is one case where that's not happened yet. And so you have someone who goes there who can respond to the IMU recruiter, I have religious freedom. I don't want anything to do with you. But in order to get a person who can do that, you have to have it. And interestingly, the response from the IMU recruiter was, well, that might be well and good for you, but my brother was arrested for having a beard and beaten by police and thrown in jail. So it only works if you apply it um, to everyone. Um, Again, serious mistakes to make in this case. If you have a very popular, influential <coughs> mufti like Rashad Kamalov, who's speaking out against ISIS, and then you go arrest him and put him away for 10 years and remove his voice, then you're shooting yourself in the foot. You're hampering your best allies um, in this effort. And then uh, maybe the most complicated one that we won't get into a lot is that um, disinformation <clears throat> And this, this sheer mass of disinformation around the ISIS issue hampers counter-messaging on all levels. So I promise to talk a little bit about Turkmenistan, and it won't be much longer. Um, we had this huge discussion about ISIS in Turkmenistan, and all of these Russian outlets and Russian expert commentators, including people sort of surprising like Arkady Dubnov, who's very good and well-respected and has spent years in the region saying, oh, there's this wild Salafist movement inside Turkmenistan. It's out of control. They're going around cutting down people's satellite dishes off of their houses and things like this. And, the, and all of these people are recruited. They formed a Salafi movement and they're recruiting people to join ISIS. And the response on Turkmen social media was this, <laughs> on the right, say, you guys are being ridiculous. Nothing like this exists. There is no Salafi brigade running around Ashgabat cutting down people's satellite dishes. This just is not happening. Um, but having this clash of you know, totally fabricated information and stuff that happens on the ground means that no one is addressing the actual problems. No one is talking about, you know, say, Turkmen, Turkmenistani migrant laborers who are living in Turkey who are actually vulnerable to recruiting um, because the entire discussion is being distorted by the sheer amount of misinformation. And this is another, this is my last slide, I promise. This is a short one. I've, I've talked about this before. I talked about it at SES in the fall, but this is just such a great example. Um, the administrator for an Uzbek Facebook group called Islam and Politics, Islam Masi Assad, posted, I think, who's become one of the, the biggest, and I think most effective sort of grassroots opponents of ISIS messaging and, and a really effective ISIS counter-messenger in Uzbek, um, posted this uh, in July of last year where he, um, it was right around Eid al-Fitr and ISIS had, uh, ISIS had set off a bomb in a crowded marketplace in Baghdad, killed more than 100 people and injured dozens. And uh, Mirakman, the administrator, said uh, he, he issued a challenge to everyone that he knew. How about you try and defend this to me? You use Islamic 
theology, you use Islamic ethics, you explain to me how you can justify this. How can you justify killing a hundred primarily women and their children who are in a crowded marketplace shopping to celebrate um, the most sacred of the Islamic holidays? Explain to me how these people can represent Islam. No one attempted to do that. No one attempted to justify that. But throughout the long discussion, over and over again, people came to him and said, brother, how could you be so stupid and gullible to believe the Western media saying that ISIS actually did this? Don't you know everything that's written about this is fake? ISIS isn't real. This stuff didn't actually happen. How could you be so gullible? And so, you know, someone like Mirakman, who has the theological background, he has the popularity, he has the influence, he has the social media savvy to really be an effective counter messenger has to begin by convincing people that ISIS even exists at all and that there are any sort of common sources of information that they could use to talk about it. Um, so that's really a serious problem and I would say at this point looking at social media, counter-recruiting, and counter-messaging, it is, it is the most serious policy problem that we face. And I'm finished. So thank you all for coming out. And we have some time left for discussion. So please introduce yourself for a segue for the mic. Hi, I'm Rebecca with the Hudson Institute. Um, a very quick question. Uh, you said a lot of this uh, misinformation about America being the backer of ISIS in the Central Asian countries, um, it's coming from Russia. So it, I, I, I don't know if you know this, but is that very, is that a popular conspiracy theory in Russia also? And is it also pervasive in maybe some of the other countries around there, like Afghanistan and Pakistan? So I'll just let that. Um, I can't speak to Afghanistan or Pakistan, but these theories have a tremendous amount of resonance in Russia as well. Yeah. Um, I'm Alex Mulekishuli, I just thank you very much. Uh, very interesting uh, and, and wide ranging presentation. I have uh, um, uh, two questions to you. First, you mentioned the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, but last time I checked, uh, it disbanded. From what I understand, so uh, I, would, I would appreciate your comment on that. And the second, <laughs> and the second has to do with the innovative uh, methods that the Kazakh authorities are using to counter um, not just Daesh, but also just uh, Islamic fundamentalism to begin with. I was wondering if you can comment on this. In particular, I uh, would like to note that uh, you have uh, uh, theatrical performances, you have involvement of NGOs that focus on rehabilitation at the penitentiaries. So thank you. Yeah. Um, well, I, I won't be able to go too much into talking about IMU because that's a separate thing. They're not completely disbanded. They continue to exist. They pledged allegiance to ISIS um, twice. It's the first time it didn't seem to stick or it didn't get the <laughs> amount of attention that they wanted. Uh, the IMU is split into a number of different factions right now. They're not all of the group agreed um, with this. Uh, the group that was in the north has historically really closely collaborated with the Taliban and not necessarily been well governed by leadership based in Pakistan. And sources that I've heard say that a lot of the fighters who were in the north basically didn't didn't agree or didn't even see themselves in a position where they could possibly agree with um, pledging allegiance to ISIS. Uh, they, they didn't want to offend the Taliban and didn't want to try to turn against them. And so there's, there's been, the group has splintered many, many times. And this is just another case where they splintered again. Um, so they're not, there's not a whole lot out there. Now, I mean, most of the, the citations where I talked about IMU were several months old already, and it's been, I don't know, they, they don't have a lot of messaging left, so there's, there's, there's not a lot to talk about with them. Um, in, in Kazakhstan, yes, uh, I think it, you do have a really multilateral social approach that includes NGOs. The only sort of other comment that I would make to that, I, I promise that I would be a little bit critical of each country, <laughs> is that um, Kazakhstan has also continued to often, particularly from a policing angle and, and prosecutor's office, 
fall into the trap of treating all religions the same and as religion as a potential problem. So some of these interesting anti-extremist efforts um, have also uh, been mobilized to create documentaries about the dangers of Jehovah's Witnesses and things like that. Um, and so you're, um, you're not really helping yourself. You're, you're creating, I mean, you're certainly Jehovah's Witnesses are not going to join ISIS because they feel discriminated against. And I don't think Muslims, for the most part, are going to join because they feel discriminated against either, you know, if, they, if their beard is too long or something. Although that really is not an issue in Kazakhstan. Um, but I think focusing so broadly and looking at religion as sort of the problem um, is not the most effective way at, at looking at it. Although I, you know, I agree with you that I think Kazakhstan deserves a lot of credit for doing things differently um, than the other countries and, and looking at this sort of whole of society approach. Um, thank you, Malpa Horimamo from The Voice of America. You did talk about the importance of religious freedom um, earlier in your presentation. As you know, over the years, it has become very difficult for this administration to promote religious freedom. Um, for the past two years, we have had at least five cases of Uzbeks being accused of supporting ISIS, um, mm -hmm. mainly in New York. Yeah. We have at least two Uzbek citizens who have been sent to prison in this country for many years um, on charges of, on very serious charges yeah. of terrorism. So what kind of options does Washington have now to, let's say, you know, to push for religious freedom with the Uzbek government? Well, I think we can do that by demonstrating that, um, that you know, normal, articulate um, Muslims are our best allies uh, in this fight. And that if you take this broad brush and you sweep over, you sweep over everyone, or you target everyone who's not directly under the control of the government. You alienated all these people who are your potential allies. I mean, I think in, you know, even in looking at the United States, uh, oftentimes in all of those cases where we see um, Uzbeks in particular who fall under recruitment by different organizations, IMU and IJU in the past, and now ISIS. In almost every case, there are people who are so radically isolated. Um, and very lonely and seem to be kind of going insane out of isolation and that's really what makes them vulnerable to recruitment. They, and in fact in several of the cases um, these people were demonstrably suicidal and were actually just looking for a way to die. Uh, and it's sort of like suicide by cop, these guys were looking for suicide by jihad. Um, I've actually I, I mean, I've read some of these email transcripts because it's the at different times, lawyers contacted me to you know, show me case material and things like this. And so, you know, in those cases, I think the best, um, the best countermeasure is community. And, and I think in many of those cases, if they had had someone uh, who, could, who could come and put an arm around them and help them feel at home and pull them back out, um, then you... Um, that's your good argument for religious freedom. You have to have that religious community in order to, to get them that way. Now, the other thing is we have to admit that in many of these cases, there are some people who are just sociopaths, or there are some people who are just suicidal. There are some people who are just this, and you know, this is where policing comes in. So I mean, it is absolutely legitimate to view this as a security threat and to police this. Um, no one is saying that it's not. But do smart policing. You know, Take, police the people who are your, the threat and not potential allies. And I think that's, that's where the argument is. Hi, uh, thank you for your presentation. I was in Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan for three months this summer and I completely know what you mean. Like this is not a joke and when I was there I was quite overwhelmed with all the like anti-American propaganda from everything from state media television to the music Russian music videos that would be showing um, to just talking with people on the street and um, I was wondering if you thought that uh, for me I've noticed that there's a lot of obviously anti-democracy suggestions within all of this um, propaganda, and so I was wondering from the perspective of Russia and the Central Asian states, um, is it the fact that they're afraid of democracy and revolution that they're trying to paint such a bad picture of the United States? Um, and then also, 
Uh, I was wondering if you came across anything with women joining ISIS or going to Syria and Iraq. Thanks. Um, to take the second question first, there, are, there have been cases um, that have been identified by different media outlets and things, <laughs> um, particularly of Tajik women who had been who were being lured by um, lured to become jihadi brides, or sometimes they didn't know that's what happened. They just met another guy who was about their age on social media, who you know they got interested in and they sparked up a relationship, and that turned out that this guy was in Syria and was trying to get get them to come there. And in those cases, you know, at that point they reported it or their parents reported it, and you know nothing came of it. I don't see, uh, I've not seen anything. Um, particularly directed at women or trying to recruit women into the ranks. And mostly it's focused on trying to get fighters, sometimes families, but the focus is on men who can carry guns for the most part. Um, yeah, I think that the consonance or the resonance of the anti-American propaganda, I mean, that goes back a long way in Uzbekistan. Actually, Uzbekistan in some ways sort of pioneered some of the tactics that, that Russian media is using now. Um, they've been doing it on their own. They, they, they discovered, it was co-invented, you know, they invented it separately. And, and they've talked for a long time about the pernicious effect of Western culture and that this will undermine national values. And coincidentally, national values are uh, respect for elder leaders, and the older Karimov comes, the more they emphasize the respect for elder <laughs> leaders, and you know that kind of thing. Um, so it, it's definitely instrumentalized, and I think in some cases, uh, for example, in, in Uzbek media, I think it, it's more often, particularly in that case, just a, a kind of uh, a coincidence that both want to talk about the same things at the same time. Um, and they're okay with the parts that resonate. Uh, Uzbekistan wants to put its foot down toward Russia and not itself fall under Russian influence. So they're just kind of, they, they both appreciate playing tunes in the same key for different reasons. Thank you. Uh, I'm Gujigit from Kyrgyzstan. I'm a CAP uh, uh, fellow. Well, the question, uh, Sometimes you can hear uh, sort of ca cautious comments uh, saying that uh, people jo joined the ISIS in Syria uh, as a response to what happened to the, uh, I mean, to to Uzbeks in the first place in 2010 uh, at the time of the violence and uh, afterwards, mm -hmm. which uh, which sound uh, um, I mean plausible and uh, obvious. But is there a hard data? Because this mm -hmm. this the, this one of the claims, cautious uh, claims, yeah. uh, used uh, by development agencies. You know. Thanks. I I mean, yeah. There's no hard data on any of it. <laughs> but when we look at estimates, you know, for example, I I think reasonably credible estimates figure that there are up to about 500 Kyrgyzstani citizens fighting in the Syrian conflict with one group or another, or were fighting at one time. You know, we, they, there are people killed every day, and sometimes they're replaced, and sometimes there's none. Um, everything I've seen tells me that the vast majority of those are Uzbeks from southern Kyrgyzstan. Um, but nothing that I have seen uh, in their own material, and a lot of them, I should I should emphasize, are not with ISIS. They're, they're, um, they're uh, so concentrated in what's called the Tavkhed Vachikhod Brigade, which is the Uzbek Brigade in Jabat al-Nusra. It's led by an Uzbek from southern Kyrgyzstan named not Abu Saifullah. Sorry, I'll, I'll I'll get it again in a second. But um, it, so they, there is an identified brigade inside Jabat al-Nusra that's led by Uzbeks from southern Kyrgyzstan. They message primarily in Cyrillic alphabet to Uzbeks from southern Kyrgyzstan, but they don't talk about you know, taking revenge against Kyrgyz, obviously, because that's very problematic. They don't talk about, you know, they don't talk about the ethnic violence. I think that the key issue here is that so many 
young Uzbek men have been displaced since 2010 and cut off from their communities and been living in Russia as migrant workers where they're also treated very badly and then they become vulnerable to recruitment from there. Not that they're recruited so much because they have this grudge or because it's being taken advantage of, not grudge, but because they have this resentment or that is specifically taken advantage of, but because just so many tens of thousands of young Uzbek men from southern Kyrgyzstan are living these marginal existences um, in Russia and in Turkey and in other places. And I think that's, it just, it just creates this sort of easily collected pool for the jihadist recruiters. Hi, thank you so much. It's been great. Um, Kathy Cosman. Um, I wanted to say that it seems to me that Uzbekistan led the way in a, in a very unfortunate direction in the sense of its religion law, <coughs> which was the first in the region to be so restrictive of all religions, but of course reserving punishment for possibly as many as 12,000 people, Uzbeks, Muslims, arrested largely, not entirely, but largely because they chose to practice Islam in ways not approved by the state, but they were peaceful. I mean, as far as we can tell, in the vast majority of cases. Um, so I think that should be the, one of the focuses of American foreign policy in, in the region. Um, but as you well know, uh, the US government, despite the, the law requiring um, annual designation of countries of particular concern. No countries were named last year. Um, who knows when and if they'll be named this year. Um, and as you know, Uzbekistan has been on that list for quite a few years. But, uh, Turkmenistan was added. Uh, however, almost immediately all the option of sanctions was dropped. So it's um, a highly theoretical, well, slap in the face at best, yeah. I would think. Um, so it seems to me that this should be, as, as you've indicated, a much more important part of this whole effort to counter yeah. uh, ISIS and other radical recruiters. But I'm not sure it is. I mean, I mean freedom yeah. of religion and the laws. Yeah, and I, I don't think, and you know, we see years of evidence for this that there, there's not much response when we, when we talk about it from a human rights angle, or when we talk about it from you know, treaty obligations and all, and, and from these, it just, or even the threat of sanctions. I don't think it really deters them, Uzbekistan in particular. But I hope that, um, I, I, I would like to hope that. Things like the release of Hayr al-Hamidov and this allowing um, some of these sort of safely apolitical uh, Muslim communities to flourish and and uh, and just practice their faith and live their lives um, will show the government itself. Uh, and I think the release of Hamidov is a sign that they're starting to figure this out. That they can't do this just with a fist. Like you, you have to, you have to have citizen allies. You have to get the population on your side. You can't just pound it down all the time. And I think the ubiquity of ISIS messaging and the sort of seriousness with which people take the threat. Um, you know, I, I don't agree that there is an imminent territorial threat to Uzbekistan. I don't think the Uzbek government actually does either. But citizens do worry about this and, and and it is now covered in media and people talk about it in a way that they didn't a year ago because the government opened the door for that by talking about it as a threat um so now they sort of have you know in a way you could say they back themselves into a corner a place where they have to show that they can respond to this and the state sponsored mufti just isn't getting the job done and so i i hope that if we can frame it this way in policy discussions um and convince them, you know, from their own experience, that allowing some religious freedom can be the very best, uh, the very best way to approach this. That we can, we can have some agreement in this. Okay. Last two question. Thank you very much for your presentation. My name is Dursun Jamal. I'm visiting scholar from Turkmenistan. Um, 
I'm really thankful that you clarified some of the, I think, uh, very confusing for some people issues about the, you know, the difference between ethnic Turkmens living in uh, Iraq or Syria and those who are actually from Turkmenistan. I think that created a lot of confusion in the in the in, in the media, at least. Uh, and just to add on, in terms of Turkmenistan, um, yeah, I agree that this is not that of a major issue in Turkmenistan, although uh, there are a lot of concerns about uh, immigrant workers traveling to Turkey and later on joining um, these um, terrorist groups. Uh, so I was wondering, because this issue of ISIS is relatively new, uh, but, you know, issue of terrorism, religious extremism was there uh, for a long time, and governments have, have been using these uh, discourse uh, for quite some time to repress the local uh, religious freedoms. So I, I was wondering what do you think, to what extent these um, Central Asian governments are using the international discourse on anti-terrorism or religious extremism to legitimize their repression on uh, local political opposition and dissent? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean heavily, <laughs> particularly in Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, um, and that's, uh, you don't see a whole lot of evidence that they actually take the threat as very seriously, they see this more as an opportunity to crack down on on local dissent and local opposition. And you know, you would think that, particularly in, in Tajikistan, where even the government is saying that now you're up to having the largest contingent of citizens in Syria. Like, at some point, you have to begin to actually take this seriously. And they've done some positive things. They have some returnees who they've, who've been amnestied, who now go around to colleges and talk about what life was really like inside the Islamic State and why they were horrified by it and why they want to leave. And there are some positive signs like that. Um, but for the most part, I think, yeah, the government sees it as a tool to, to crush dissent. And the last question. Thank you. Uh, Marat Brankano from Kazakhstan, Fulbright Fellow. So I'm doing research on propaganda in general. and. Russian and ISIS propaganda in particular, mm -hmm. those have too much, too, too, too many things in common. So um, ISIS has been very effective in recruiting uh, fighters online using social media, using very subtle techniques, Hollywood style yeah. uh, movies, uh, video games, uh, etc., etc. So, uh, but don't you think that ISIS is just another terrorist network that would hopefully be defeated any time soon, and maybe not soon. But uh, the, the problem is that there will be another terrorist network or another terrorist extremist organization, and they will start using more subtle techniques, more uh, pervasive propaganda. So, what, what do you think? What do you think about that? I think, yeah, that's that's definitely a possibility, and this is all the more reason why it's so important for states not to try to do this alone with government alone. You have to you have to allow civil society partners and religious figures and ordinary people some space um, to discover ways that they can counter this and allow communities enough space that they can counter this uh, it, when their own members become, you know, when their son or when their nephew becomes interested in this, he needs to have an imam that he can take him to, who can explain to him why, you know, why the caliphate is not legitimate according to the way that they, you know, Kazakhs understand Islam and Uzbeks understand Islam, but if he doesn't have that person who can articulate that to him, um, then you know you're missing this key ally there, um, and I, I think so. I think the takeaway from this is yeah, this, the problem is big, and it's become. I think all the Central Asian governments admit have admitted publicly that because of social media, it's impossible to just block all this out. You can't solve it by policing alone. You have to have society partners. You have to have religious partners. Um, this has to be a social problem that's addressed by society and not by the state alone. Okay, on that note, I think it's time for us to conclude. Please thank Noah for the great work he's doing. <laughs>